Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, Dental and Oral Health for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm here in uh, Texas, USA. It's just gone uh, nine o'clock in the morning. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, oral pharyngeal airway changes in adults following biomimetic oral appliance therapy. And so the real um, uh, kind of condition that we are treating is uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And we're going to use a biomimetic approach, which is a relatively new uh, method, technique. Um, and so we'll go through some of those changes today. Um, so uh, I'm based in the US and um, my affiliation is with uh, Vivo Therapeutics. I'm the founder and the chief medical officer. Um, I've received no financial support from Vivos for this particular presentation. And Vivos wants to support medical and dental professionals to provide continuing education to keep them updated with medical and dental knowledge uh, to make sure that they are updated uh, as required for practice permit renewals. Um, the uh, content of my uh, talk today is uh, very briefly mentioned in my new book, uh, which is Pneumopedics and Craniofacial Epigenetics on the right hand side here on my screen. Uh, this was published uh, just uh, about a few weeks ago. And uh, so many of the uh, topics I'll talk about are covered uh, in that book and also my previous book, which was the Epigenetic Orthodontic book. So in terms of uh, sleep apnea, you know, the question people often ask is, uh, do I snore? And as far as the dental profession is concerned, you know, the second question we would ask clinically is, do I need a device for mandibular advancement? Well, if you look at this bulldog from the side view, from the profile, you can see that it's prognathic. The mandible is already protruded. And so we have to ask the question in patients who are class three with the class three malocclusion, would we use mandibular advancement devices even for those patients if they have a diagnosis of mild or moderate sleep apnea? Now, the work done at Stanford University by the late Dr. Gimino and his colleagues showed there's an interaction between the craniofacial structure, craniofacial morphology, and the upper airway. And so we can re ask the research question, which is, can we change the phenotype non-surgically? Um, here is a uh, particular example of a phenotype associated with OSA, obstructive sleep apnea. The question is, how can we change that without using a surgical method? So before we do that, we need to ask the question, what is the pathophysiology of OSA? And note that OSA is a very small component of sleep medicine. There are numerous uh, sleep disorders. And if you think about OSA, it could be due to neurologic uh, conditions such as deficient neuromotor tone. In other words, the uh, upper airway has a high degree of collapsibility simply because the muscle tone is too low. And that may be associated with some genetic uh, disorders or there may be some metabolic and hormonal components that precipitate uh, sleep apnea. And a good example of that would be obesity. So patients who are obese, they have a high BMI, um, the tissue pressure can cause the upper airway to collapse and, uh, and produce obstruction. The third group, which is the most important group to dentists and orthodontists and those people working in craniofacial uh, endeavors is looking at children who have got uh, hypertrophy of the adenoids or the tonsils or both and other patients, adult patients, uh, teenagers with some craniofacial deficiency. For example, the mandible is retrognathic producing a class two type of profile. So we have to think about how OSA is precipitated and then we have to ask the question, can we change these phenotypes on surgically can I change the craniofacial structure so that they are less uh, lowered risk of sleep apnea? Here's a study that was done back in 2002, and it notes that both craniofacial size and obesity can alter the upper airway. So looking at the first row, which is a normal control example, there's a normal amount of soft tissue. The bony enclosure is also within normal limits and that produces a normal airway size. In the middle row here, 
here's a patient with a high BMI who has a clinical diagnosis of obesity. There is excess soft tissue. The bony architecture is within normal limits, but the tissue effect and the tissue pressure here is causing airway collapse. You can see it that the airway is much smaller because all this excess tissue is putting pressure on the airway. And then the third row here, this is a non-obese patient. The BMI is with normal limits, but they have a small maxilla and a small mandible, to put it in simple terms. And so there's a relative increase in tissue pressure since the surrounding skeletal elements are deficient. The tissue pressure here is causing airway collapse. And so the way that um, the OSA is typically treated is with CPAP. That's continuous positive airway pressure. And that is both diagnosed and prescribed by our physician medical colleagues, the sleep specialists. Um, and so we have to ask the question is, what is the effect, the long-term effect of CPAP use? Well, the conclusion is that CPAP does not address the underlying issue. In other words, if you take the CPAP away, if the patient stops using the CPAP, the uh, OSA will be the same and sometimes it actually gets worse. And so what we now know, this study just came out in this year, 2021, is that CPAP does not produce long-term clinically significant outcomes in the treatment of OSA. In other words, as long as you wear the CPAP mask whilst you're sleeping for the rest of your life, the condition will be controlled. But if you forget to wear the mask, then there's a high incidence, a high risk that you will have sleep apnea um, during sleep. And that was, will get progressively worse as the patient gets older. So now we have to think, what is the alternative to CPAP? What else can we use to treat obstructive sleep apnea? And so the, one of the options that the dental profession came up with is mandibular advancement devices, MAD, mandibular advancement devices. And what these devices do, as the name suggests, is they reposition the mandible forwards. They protrude the mandible in an effort to keep the airway open. And that seems like, you know, not a bad idea. Uh, in the emergency situation, it's a, it's a good line of, um, of treatment. But the question is, what about the long-term use? If you protrude the mandible over a long period of time wearing these devices, what can happen is you can get derangement of the occlusion. You can see these study models here with a massive anterior open bite. So in this case, the patient's sleep amnia was addressed by protruding the mandible. The sleep amnia became under control, but over a long period of time, they developed this anterior open bite. And here's another patient here again, who wore a mandibular advancement device for several years, um, talking between five years and seven years. And you can see the bilateral posterior open bite that has been created by this, this particular protocol. But worse still is this is a study that was done in 2016, is that PSG's polysomnographs, this is the sleep study done with and without a mandibular advancement device it was done for patients who were treated for about 15 years. Now, if you take the device away after 15 years and do a sleep study, the apnea hypopnea index, AHI, increased from 17 to about 32. It almost doubled. The condition got twice as bad over about 15 years if you take the device away. And so similar to CPAP, the normal oral appliances that are used can cause a deterioration or are associated with the deterioration of the disease with continuous long-term use. So now the question is biomimetic oral appliance therapy, what is so different about this uh, protocol compared to mandibular advancement devices? Well, in a nutshell, biomimetic oral appliance therapy is aimed at remodeling the upper airway and by providing treatment protocols that address the underlying etiology of the craniofacial signs and symptoms associated with sleep disordered breathing, SDV, and OSA, obstructive sleep apnea. So biomimetics is a big uh, field of endeavor of research. We're mimicking the body 
the way the body grows, the way the body develops. That is what we are trying to mimic with oral pine therapy. We are not simply protruding the mandible. And by taking this approach, what we are suggesting is you can actually remodel the upper airway. Now we know that remodeling occurs in many conditions such as asthma, COPD, bronchitis, et cetera. And so the question is, can we use this um, protocol to actually improve the airway in patients with uh, sleep apnea? You know, I discussed the idea of airway remodeling with the late uh, Dr. Giminel. This is at the World Association of Sleep Medicine. This is back in 2015. And uh, he wrote me a personal communication, you know, before he passed in 2018. And he confirmed my concept that remodeling exists in many organs throughout the body. So will also probably occur in the upper airway as well. And so it's really left for us to demonstrate and provide evidence that upper airway remodeling is feasible, that it's achievable by dentists, general dentists, and by orthodontists and it's within the realm of the dental profession. So let's give an example here. This is the craniofacial effects following a biomimetic oral pine therapy. This is a 38 year old adult patient diagnosed with moderate sleep apnea. And what I'm showing here is the upper arch. On the left side, you can see the arch before treatment. And here on the right side is the same patient. This is about 10 months after treatment. And we can see that the arch seems to have gotten bigger and there are some spaces in between the teeth here. And so what we find after 10 months of active treatment is the actual bone width, the transpaltum bone width increased from about 34 to 39 millimeters. If you take a 3D CD scan, the red area here shows you the airway um, prior to treatment. And we took a scan 15 months later after treatment's been finished. It seems to be bigger here. And if you actually measure it, you find there was a 70% increase in upper airway volume from about 12.9 cc's to about 22 cc's um, after about you know a year of treatment. And so if you look at the upper airway in this particular individual, you can see that there's been quite a dramatic change in the morphology of the upper airway. You can see it's kind of funnel shaped and collapsed prior to treatment. And here it is post treatment. And remember the interesting thing is there is no device in the patient's mouth when these scans are taken. But the real kind of cream on the cake, the real big bonus here is that the apnea hypopnea index decreased from 24 events per hour, that's moderate sleep apnea, to about 2.8 events per hour uh, after about 10 months with no device in the patient's mouth. Now, if you have an AHI of less than five, that is considered to be a resolution of the sleep apnea itself. So the medical colleagues will not treat a patient who has an AHI of less than five. So that was the one example. And here's another one we just published this year, this year um, 2021 in the World Journal of Clinical Cases. And so what I want to do here was just to highlight the difference between biomimetic oral plant therapy and mandibular advancement devices. So in this case here, we have a patient who's 50 years old. Uh, he started his treatment uh, back in 2008. He had an apnea hypopnea index of 33 events per hour, which by definition is severe sleep apnea. And severe sleep apnea is treated by the medical physicians, not by dentists. However, this patient uh, declined to use CPAP. He declined to use, um, uh, uh, to have a surgical procedure done. And so the only alternative left for him at that time was a mandibular advancement device. And so he wore it as prescribed for 10 years. So here he is uh, 10 years later, he's now 60 years old. The sleep study was done in 2019. And what it showed is the apnea hypopnea index has kind of more than doubled to 68 events per hour. And as we know, long-term mandibular advancement device use does not address the underlying condition. But if you take the device away, the condition actually keeps on getting worse as the patient gets older. Well, this patient had heard about biomedic oral pine therapy and came to the dental office and asked for a, a review. And so after discussion with our medical colleagues, he was put onto a biomedical appliance. And here he is now in, uh, he's about 61, 
yeah, about a year later, actually it's about 10 months later. And what we see when we did the sleep study here with no device in the patient's mouth, the apnea hypopnea index has been decreased about 12 events per hour. He's not quite finished, but you can see the remodeling that's occurred in his upper arch wearing this device and look at the effect it's had on this dramatic effect on the re reduction of the AGI. And so here's the actual sleep study um, that shows that, you know, prior to treatment, he was at 32.8, about 33 events per hour. And here he is, you know, uh, 10 years later, it's increased to 67.9, about 68 events per hour. And here's a sleep study that we did with the event. So 11.8, with about 12 events per hour after about a year of biomedic oral pyrotherapy. And we can go through all of these um, statistics here to show what's going on. But uh, generally speaking, he's sleeping a lot better than he was uh, for the last 10 years. So if we look at the uh, published studies, what they show is that uh, there's evidence of anatomic airway changes with surgery and dental appliance treatment for OSA. Now, if you actually read this study, they talk about a dental appliance. The dental appliance they're actually referring to is the biomedic oral device that I just mentioned. It's not really a dental appliance because it has no effect or direct effect on the teeth. The target tissue is the upper airway. And so we prefer to call it a biomedic oral appliance. So if we look at some of these other examples, here's a 3D cam beam scan. It's been superimposed to show changes in the upper airway. And before treatment, we measured the transpartal bone width. It's about 31 millimeters. And then post-treatment, you can see it's been increased to about 35 and a half millimeters. So the airway here, sorry, the upper arch actually got wider in this adult patient. And then if you look from the profile view, this is the same patient prior to treatment behind the palate, the retropalatal distance was about two millimeters. And behind the tongue, the retrogostal distance was about five millimeters. And that has been increased from 2.2 to 4.7 post-treatment and from five millimeters to eight millimeters post-treatment. And if you look at the scan very carefully, you can see the profile of the mandible here. And the mandible has actually moved forwards. But remember, no mandibular advancement device was used here. This was a biomedic or appliance, one predominantly in the upper arch. It remodels the upper arch, allows the mandible to move forwards and remodels the airway at the same time. So the question is, what is the effect on the uh, lower airway in adult patients? So here's the study. We're going to test the hypothesis that the oropharyngeal airway can be enhanced in adults and it's going to be done non-surgically without CPAP so that breathing and sleeping might be enhanced for these patients. And so in this study that we did, as done in South Korea, we had 13 consecutive adult patients aged between 18 to 52 years old. They were treated using biomedical oral appliance therapy by an orthodontist, uh, Dr. Hinam Kim, and he undertook advanced training in craniofacial sleep medicine with ourselves. And then all the uh, scans, the 3D cone beam CD scans were taken prior to and after treatment with no device in the patient's mouth. So you can see here that uh, from the scan, we can measure the airway volume. It's about 15 cc, 14.9 uh, prior to treatment. And in this example, it's increased to about 24 cc, 24.5. Um, you can see the dramatic changes in the airway. There's no device in the patient's mouth when the reading was taken. And so, what are the results on the craniofacial and lower airway parameters in this study? The treatment time was about 16 months. If you look at the gonial angle, the mandibular angle before and after treatment, um, it didn't really change, which means we're not really affecting the mandible very much. There was no statistical change here. And if you measure the angle of the lower incisors in terms of the inclination, again, no change. So what this is telling us is that we didn't really affect the mandible and we didn't really affect the teeth that very much. But if you look at the anterior-posterior retroglossal distance, the distance behind the tongue, 
And that increased statistically from 12.8 to 13.5 millimeters on average. That was statistically significant. And then if you look at the retroglossal width, um, it increased from 23.7 to 26.4 millimeters. It actually marginally failed to reach statistical significance in this study. And if you measure the retrogrossal area, that's the surface area of the airway behind the tongue, it increased dramatically from 273 to about 351 millimeters squared. Now, these are important findings because according to the medical literature, an anatomically narrow uh, airway or a highly collapsible airway is the main cause of sleep apnea. And so what we are doing is we are widening and making enlarging the uh, actual airway. And that's probably related to airway remodeling. And if that's the case, we can probably prevent or reduce the severity of sleep apnea. I actually did a review of airway remodeling uh, in the medical literature. And what you find is that there are several conditions, asthma, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, bronchitis, etc., uh, including you know nasal algaes and um, rhinitis. You'll find that there is airway remodeling in many of those conditions. Um, the question is whether we can use that remodeling mechanism to actually improve structural sleep apnea in adult patients. So. It may be possible to change the size and the shape of the upper airway through non-surgical air remodeling. Here's an example of a patient pre-treatment. This is the airway from the side, and here's the airway from the front. This is a 3D printed model from the scan, and you can see that post-treatment, there's been a dramatic improvement in the shape and size and morphology of this upper airway. So we even call this pneumopedics. Um, so we've got orthodontics, which is moving teeth, and orthopedics, which is remodeling bone, and pneumopedics, which is remodeling the upper airway. And this is done on a non-surgical basis. Here's another example just to illustrate actually what happens with the airway. You get these kind of changes in shape and size, and therefore functionality of the upper airway is uh, maintained during sleep to prevent collapse and prevent the sleep apnea from occurring. So uh, in conclusion, um, biomedical appliance therapy appears to be able to improve the lower oral pharyngeal airway parameters in Korean adults, and it may represent an alternative choice to mandibular advancement devices, but additional studies are needed to show the effect of, on sleep itself. So these current findings may help doctors and dentists in the management of patients diagnosed with sleep apnea using the idea of pneumopedics, which is airway modeling, and craniofacial epigenetics which is really uh, an epigenetic mechanism to permit the remodeling to occur. Um, as I mentioned, these uh, concepts are described and discussed in my new book, Pneumopedics and Craniofacial Epigenetics. Um, the foreword is written by uh, Stanford University in the USA Department of Sleep Medicine. Um, and again, I want to thank you for your attention uh, today. And if there are any questions, I will try to address them. Thank you so much.